Hello and welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, if Dickens read Calacansa Roy. There's an impish fairy only seen in mythic Europe during the 12 days of Christmas, the Calacanceros, which has never been used in any of the supplements as far as I'm aware. As the Yule's approaching, I'd like to bring them out, but give them a fresh coat of paint by combining them with the goblins who stole a sexton, which was the first of the papers of the Pickwick Club provided by Mr. Dickens. The creature that speaks to the sexton in the story that follows is apparently the king of the tribe. It's convenient to give him different statistics so that he has enough power to perform the two magical effects that occur in the story, but don't seem to be common to the rest of his people. If you've read Hedge Magic, you may recall Ecstasis, the virtue of straying in spirit form, In some areas, children born during the 12 days of Christmas can stray as Calacanceroi. This can be prevented with folk charms like binding the child in special herbs or by singeing its toenails, but your character may not want that. The recording used in this episode was released into the public domain by Neslahan Stamboli, thanks to Neslahan. Statistics for the common and royal Calacanceroi are on the blog that accompanies this podcast. The statistics for the common Calacanceroi are based on those from Realms of Power, Fairy, page 87. And now with thanks over to Neslahan. The Christmas Goblins. Recording by Neslahan Stamboli. In an old abbey town a long, long while ago, there officiated a sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard, one Gabriel Grump. He was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. A little before twilight one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern and betook himself toward the old churchyard, for he had a grave to finish by next morning. And feeling very low, He thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. He strode along until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard, a nice, gloomy, mournful place into which the townspeople did not care to go except in broad daylight. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a Merry Christmas. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, then wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand to his head, Gabriel Grubb chuckled to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, put down his lantern, and getting into an unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with right good will. But the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. At any other time, this would have made Gabriel very miserable, but he was so pleased at having stopped the small boy singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made when he had finished work for the night, and looked down into the grave with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one. A few feet of cold earth when life is done. <laughs> he laughed as he set himself down on a flat tombstone, which was a favorite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas, a Christmas box. <laughs> <laughs> repeated a voice close beside him. It was the echoes, said he, raising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him, was a strange, unearthly figure. He was sitting perfectly still, grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin would call up. 
What do you hear on Christmas Eve? said the goblin sternly. I, uh, I came to dig a grave, sir, stammered Gabriel. What man wanders among graves on such a night as this? cried the goblin. Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Uh, Holland, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he had bought it of the smugglers, and he thought his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Holland's alone and in a churchyard on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb exclaimed the wild voices again. And who then is our lawful prize? exclaimed the goblin, raising his voice. The invisible chorus replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? said the goblin, as he grinned a broader grin than before. The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? It's, um, it's very curious, sir. Uh, very curious, sir, and uh, very pretty, replied the sexton, half dead with fright. Uh, but I think I'll go back and uh, finish my work, sir, uh, if you please. Work, said the goblin. What work? The grave, sir. Oh, the grave, eh? Who makes graves at a time when other men are merry and takes a pleasure in it? Again the voices replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. I'm afraid, my friends, won't you, Gabriel? said the goblin. Uh, under favour, sir, replied the horror-stricken sexton. Uh, uh, I don't think they can. Uh, they don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me. Oh, yes, they have. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry and he could not. Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh which the echoes returned twentyfold. I, uh, I'm afraid I must leave you, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us, said the goblin. <laughs> As the goblin laughed, he suddenly darted toward Gabriel, laid his hand upon his collar, and sank with him through the earth. And when he had had time to fetch his breath, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by goblins, ugly and grim. And now, said the king of the goblins, seated in the center of the room on an elevated seat, his friend of the churchyard, show the man of misery and gloom a few of the pictures from our great storehouses. As the goblin said this, a cloud rolled gradually away and disclosed a small and scantily furnished but neat apartment. Little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown or gambling round her chair. A frugal meal was spread upon the table and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. Soon the father entered and the children ran to meet him. As he sat down to his meal, the mother sat by his side and all seemed happiness and comfort. What do you think of that? said the goblin. Gabriel murmured something about its being very pretty. Show him some more, said the goblin. Many a time the cloud went and came, and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb. He saw that man who worked hard and earned their scanty bread were cheerful and happy, and he came to the conclusion it was a very respectable sort of a world after all. No sooner had he formed it 
then the cloud closed over the last picture, seemed to settle on his senses and lull him to repose. One by one, the goblins faded from his sight, and as the last one disappeared, he sank to sleep. The day had broken when he awoke and found himself lying on the flat gravestone with the wicker bottle empty by his side. He got on his feet as well as he could and brushing the frost off his coat turned his face toward the town. But he was an altered man. He had learned lessons of gentleness and good nature by his strange adventures in the goblin's cavern.